Hello and welcome. I'm Seth Clevenger, Managing Editor of Features at Transport Topics, and it's great to be with you, remotely at least, to moderate our first panel discussion at this virtual symposium co-hosted by CQ Roll Call and Transport Topics. In this session, we're going to discuss the future of freight, the global supply chain, and risk mitigation. The coronavirus pandemic has placed significant strain on many freight networks, forcing shippers, carriers, and third-party logistics providers to adapt to new challenges and volatile market conditions. To ensure that essential freight continues to reach its destination, supply chain leaders have been taking a fresh look at procurement, inventory management, and final mile delivery strategies as they respond to the current crisis and prepare for future disruptions. To help us learn more about these important trends, I'm excited to welcome two industry leaders. First, I'd like to introduce Chad England, CEO of CR England, a major truckload carrier and logistics provider with annual revenue of more than 1.5 billion. Also joining us is Drew Wilkerson, president of XBO Logistics Transportation Group in North America. XBO, of course, is one of the industry's largest providers of freight brokerage, warehousing, and less than truckload and final mile transportation. So I'd like to begin the conversation by discussing how transportation companies responded to the disruption caused by this COVID-19 pandemic, which of course has just tested the flexibility of freight net networks across uh, North America and really the world. So I'll start with you, Drew. Could you just give us an overview of how XBO adjusted its operations and how the company uh, contributed to the country's response to this outbreak? Seth, th thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to the conversations today. It's, it's exciting to be a part of the panel. At XBO, we're always managing our risk. We've always known our employees were essential workers, but we saw it more through COVID-19 and our team stepped up to the plate. I've never been more proud to be a part of XPO than what I was through the COVID-19 pandemic. The first thing we had to focus on was safety. We focused on social distancing, wearing masks, deep cleaning. We went well beyond what the CDC required us to do. We were thinking about the health and the mental health of our employees. We offered free testing for our employees. We had access to 24 seven nurses and doctors. Even if our employees had opted out of our healthcare, we still offer to treat them if they contracted COVID-19. On the contribution side, it's something I'm really proud of. We all saw during the pandemic that New York City was the epicenter. And you saw these hospitals on television, these pop-up hospitals throughout Central Park. All of the equipment that went in there, we were a contributor to that transportation. The beds, the medicine, the masks, the face shields, the ventilators were all part of what we did. One other one that I'd like to highlight is Ford. Ford shifted from making automobiles to making masks, gowns, ventilators, and other PPE gear. We delivered over a million ventilators for Ford, and we were their primary partner for getting essential goods across the country. I'm proud of the team and what they accomplished, and I know that the work that we did saved lives across the country. Well, there's no doubt that uh, really the, the this whole event has raised the profile of the transportation industry and you know uh, we of course we uh, in, within the industry know how essential this work is every day but i think that you know society at large has, has seen it during a time like this and uh, chad i'd like to ask you the same question you know just take us through you know how did cr england you know adjust to all the challenges that were caused by this pandemic and and uh, how did your company participate in the response well first of all i'm happy to participate in this panel and Thanks, Seth, and to Transport Topics for including uh, me in this. And, uh, you know, honestly, it was a lot like what Drew said for us. You know, I'd like to think we got started pretty early. Uh, we really started worrying about the safety of our employees. And that was the, the first thing. And so uh, we actually, um, one of the first companies, uh, our headquarters is in, is in Salt Lake City. We were one of the first companies that I know of that started to work from home that started to take some precautions with masks and, and, uh, and we really jumped on it quickly. But, you know, the very first thing we did was enlist our people. We started talking to our frontliners. Uh, we started enlisting, enlisting them and uh, thanking them in advance for participating. You know, of course, we're an essential industry. Uh, it's an essential function for our country and uh, it's mission critical that everybody on our team was supporting the, the great responsibility that we felt like we had to keep this country going. So when things got more serious, uh, uh, it was amazing to me to 
to see how our team stepped up. It was unbelievable and, and still is to see the way that we came together, not apart as these challenges mounted. Um, you know, we had one particular day uh, in Salt Lake where we had an earthquake. It was actually a middle, a major earthquake in the middle of a pandemic. Um, it was right when we were testing our work from home systems and we had about half of our crew in the office. I happened to be here uh, when, when this place shook and it shook hard. And uh, it was so cool to see the way that people supported each other. Um, my brother was standing right next to me and, and uh, I'm embarrassed to say I jumped under a desk. He, he made sure everybody else did. Uh, it, it was uh, pretty awesome uh, to see the support that, that people had for each other. So we did all the things that everybody's done as far as, uh, you know, safety practices and mass and disinfectant and, and social distancing. You know, we run some truck driving schools and we made sure that people were separated and, and that's a pretty big challenge in, in this environment. Um, but we made all kinds of adjustments. Uh, what, what kept going was frequent communication with our team, with our customers. Uh, you know, we'll get into more of that stuff later, but uh, you know, we wanted to make sure that we're, we're we were protecting that infrastructure. And uh, so, you know, we, we call our drivers after this, our heroes of the road. Um, I'm, I'm so thankful for those that felt that responsibility and carried the weight and literally pulled the loads to uh, make sure that the American families had had food and supplies during this difficult time. Well, thank you both for, for sharing you know, your experiences thus far. Uh, now, of course, we're still dealing with COVID-19. You know, we're, we're not out of the woods yet on this, but you know, I think it's interesting to think about what the future will look like, what the new normal is going to be uh, post-pandemic. Uh, so I'd like to ask each of you, just what is this industry going to look like and, and how will this crisis just change uh, the way supply chains are built and designed in the long term? Uh, Drew, I'll start with you on that. Yeah, Seth, these are conversations we're having with our customers every single day. And what we're hearing from our customers, especially the large retail customers, is they're looking to de-risk in their supply chains as well as the transportation that they're providing uh, across the country. The pandemic has shown them that they're looking for large-scale, financially stable companies that they know are going to be here after the pandemic. And so it's important that you, you have those things but it's also important that you're giving them access to massive amounts of capacity. Customers want capacity. They wanna be able to deal in multiple modes of transportation, have automation, real estate options, labor pools, and then obviously robust technology is, is a huge deal for, for customers as we go forward. You know, four things that I would call out that we've heard from customers that they're focused on throughout the pandemic and going forward has been safety, service, fulfillment speed, and transportation visibility. So we've really been focused on helping some of our brick and mortar customers that in the retail sector shift more from omni-channel into the e-commerce growth. And customers, both retail and non-retail, are looking for providers that can flex capacity up and down as the market goes. Obviously on the e-commerce, you've seen the tightening of capacity, so they need somebody who can flex up. But on some of the manufacturing side, you need somebody who can actually scale down, but it's still going to guarantee you that capacity and have you a truck and be committed to you long term and be a long term partner. You know, and uh, Chad, I'll ask you the, the same thing. You know, you got to get your thoughts on, uh, you know, what do you think supply chains are going to look like, you know, long term after we've gone through all this? Well, I, I think the fragility of the modern supply chain supply chain has been exposed a little bit. And um, in some ways we've seen it's fragile, in other ways we've seen how resilient it is. Um, the people are resilient, some of the processes may be a little bit fragile. Um, for example, uh, we, we uh, hire a lot of drivers, we're a big company, bring in a lot of drivers, and we have seen how it's so much more challenging to train and license new drivers. It can take months to get an appointment from, uh, for a CDL test in many states. Classroom and group learning is difficult to mix with social distancing. These challenges are creating an unprecedented shortage of new drivers entering the industry. Advertising costs for new or experienced drivers are up dramatically. Because of this, fleets are 
fighting with each other over drivers and, and shrinking and supply is short for shippers. Uh, so while some of these pressures will soften over the long term, the driver recruiting and training and licensing and hiring processes, I think are gonna be permanently tighter than in the past. We've all talked about driver shortages for years. I think the real driver shortage is here now and here for a long time. Uh, you know, another uh, way to look at this, I think, is that the pandemic will drive supply chain diversification more than deglobalization. And just like uh, Drew was saying, I, you know, the capacity that our shippers are relying on, I think, is going to, ch to change behavior. I, I think they'll diversify their networks. I think they'll they'll make a number of changes that will will impact this thing. And so, you know, it'll be interesting to see uh, how much the time frame this time frame per permanently changes consumer behavior. For example, will people go back to restaurants as often as before? Will they stay at home or consume more food from grocery stores? I, I think it's uh, one other thing that I think is worth noting is it's becoming more difficult and expensive to provide expedited team service uh, because of the driver challenges. I think the driver, the industry will experience reduced team capacity and a significant team cost increase due to, to the level of risks associated with team, team driving. You know, those, these are all you know, fascinating insights. And, and of course, both of you are seeing this firsthand and have been for these past uh, several months now. And you know, I want to pick up on one of the points you made chat about uh, you know resiliency on one hand but f but fragility on the other in some ways and you know of course over time there's been a lot of movement toward you know just in time inventory models um, so I'm wondering if we're going to start to see a shift back toward you know larger stockpiles for certain types of freight uh, certain product categories as a result of this event you know of course you know generally if you wanted food during the pandemic you could get food which is a absolutely a credit to um, all the work that, that our industry does, but um, if you wanted toilet paper for a while, uh, you had to you had to wait for you know, a couple of weeks unless you were right there when a truck arrived. Um, but I'll start with you, Drew. You know, do you think that uh, uh, shippers and logistics companies are going to think differently about inventory management in light of COVID nineteen, and uh, if so, how? Yeah, so I think that it's a great question, Seth. And we saw the consumer demands really changed overnight with COVID, especially if you look at e-commerce. E-commerce was, we expected massive growth over the next three years, but what we expected over the next three years, we got in the middle of COVID-19. And so it, it was definitely an elevation of what we saw there on the e-commerce side. As far as the inventory goes, you know, that is something that obviously you can do in your supply chain, but it's also very costly to do to have inventory just sitting rows within your warehouse and it's not being used. So that's, that's something that the customers have to weigh is how much inventory that they want to have that is going out. And what we have to do within that, we have to be flexible and agile in how we're dealing with and, and helping them solve these, these tough problems. We've got to be able to leverage our technology. We've got to be able to flex the capacity up and down as Chad and I both uh, alluded to. But on, on the technology piece, you know, we're, we're focused on our XPO Connect platform and how can we show them multiple modes of transportation and give them visibility across the supply chain, but also give them industry trends as what's going on within, um, if you look at the hurricanes that just hit down in Florida and Louisiana and Texas, how can you tell them which routes are being adjusted and what's happening there within your technology? How can you tell your drivers where to buy fuel at and where, where to eat at for decent prices as things that we're focused on within our technology platform? I think, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I think a number of companies and transportation managers have been burned um, by by the issues with resiliency in the supply chain. Um, you know, I just looked at uh, an inventory to sales ratio chart uh, for total business. And what it showed was that, you know, between 2010 and pre-pandemic, the, the, the inventories were going up a little bit anyway. You know, after decades of, of dropping, we're not quite as just in time as we were before. And thank goodness, during the pandemic, that's how it played out. But I, I do think that, uh, you know, that each company is going to have to weigh that balance, right? Uh, how, how much inventory are they going to hold? I do think it will go up a bit, but, you know, there's only so much that, that can be afforded. So 
uh, you know, we're in the same situation. We're here to to make sure that as as cycles change, as needs change, we're here to support our customers. And as we uh, make that a, a huge focus, then we'll we'll do things the right way and and be successful. Got it. You know, another uh, piece of the conversation that's uh, you know, really kind of gained steam because of this uh, event has been talk about uh, nearshoring of manufacturing. You know, there's there's some indication at least that that is uh, happening more. You know, there was a, a Gartner survey of uh, 260 global supply chain leaders that was conducted back in February and March, so really you know before uh, the pandemic really uh, took hold, but. Uh, you know, that survey found that 33% of uh, supply chain leaders had moved sourcing and manufacturing activities out of China or plan to do so in the next two or two or three years. Uh, so I want to get your thoughts on this. You know, do you, do you expect the, the nearshoring trend to accelerate? Um, and, and if so, to what extent? And how will that affect freight transportation in uh, North America? Uh, Drew, you want to take the first crack at that? Sure. We expect it to accelerate. As you said, the survey was done right before the pandemic. So we, we do expect it to accelerate from the conversations that we're having with our customers. And, you know, we expect it in the U.S. as well as in Mexico where you're going to see this. And it's going to create an additional transportation need across it. I think the intermodal market specifically is going to benefit it whenever you start looking about at the cross-border transportation that's going to come from this. But for supply chains overall, they're going to, in the, in the U.S., they're going to look to their vendors and they're going to see how close they can get their vendors because what's their goal? Their goal is to get the end consumer the product as quickly as possible. So they're going to pull their vendors as closely as possible so that they can get the end consumer the product as quickly as they can. I, I agree with that. Um, I, I also believe that we'll see nearshoring accelerate uh, and it's because of the market. You know, uh, you think of what it costs uh, to to get manufacturing done in Mexico right now compared to China. You know, China has been the cost has been going up dramatically. Mexico, not as much. And so I, I think the markets are pushing things that direction. Uh, that's great for our business. We're, uh, as far as I know, the largest uh, carrier going back and forth across the border with temperature controlled products. And so. Uh, we we love to see that, and then, of course, balance is a, a big thing that you got to think of too. Um, you know, the trade balance the U.S. has with with Mexico currently we're at a, at a deficit, and, and we got to get that right. So, you know, there's about a hundred million dollar gap on that with with Mexico, and and we love to see that balanced out because it's healthier for the freight market. But you know, as as one that um, cares a heck of a lot about the I, I can tell you, Mexico is is uh, producing some great things, and uh, and America needs to step up our game in the way that we produce. Our manufacturing uh, needs to improve to make the uh, you know let's near shore to our hometowns. Let's let's make sure that the manufacturing is happening right here. I'm not worried about uh, what mode it'll go because ultimately everything essentially gets delivered by truck. Can't, can't skip that part of the process. I mean, you know, you know the vast majority of, of freight in uh, North America, of course, is delivered by truck. Um, now, we've already touched on my next question a little bit, uh, but I'd like to go into a little bit more depth. And that's really just kind of looking at the balance of, you know, kind of these competing goals. You know, on one hand, there's the goal of, you know, optimizing freight efficiency, you know, making things as streamlined as possible. Uh, but at the same time, especially in light of this pandemic, uh, there's a clear need for supply chain resilience. Uh, and, and, you know, as you know, sometimes those priorities can lead you in, in different directions. So, you know, how do you find that balance? I'll start with you, Chad, on this one. You know, how, how do you balance that, you know, again, the, the need for efficiency and resilience? You bet. Well, in any business, there are efficiency trade-offs. Like we were discussing earlier, shippers are now forced to consider how to balance just-in-time standards with higher inventories to protect against product shortage risks. In our business, we have a myriad of efficiency trade-offs to consider. As markets cycle, we often ask or have to ask ourselves the question, do we keep our year-round load commitments when there are higher paying seasonal loads available to us? Uh, you know, what kind of relationship do we have with our customers? And if we chase, if we chase the higher paying seasonal freight, uh, we may be stuck with nothing later. So 
it comes down to the strategy that will best help you compete. In our case, that's developing really tight partnerships with our customers. We'll bend over backwards to keep our commitments and gravitate to customers that feel the same way. Uh, if there's a proven track record and mutual trust, that creates a consistent, resilient si situation and less ups and downs. There are others that thrive by chasing the chasing the buck, and and uh, you know, I, I maybe I'm not brave enough to to go after that strategy, but but I'll tell you, uh, I think consistency and trust are values that we we stick to and uh, and have worked well for us in the past. And Drew, I'm very curious to hear your perspective on this question at, at XPO as well. Um, you know, how, how do you find that you know proper balance between you know optimizing efficiency and also ensuring uh, reliability and resilience? Yeah, what I, what I just heard Chad say, I, I agree with. It, it comes down to service and relationship with your customers. And that's something that we're focused on every single day at XPO. We have to be flexible and agile with how we're dealing with them because it is a, a unique situation that we've never seen with, with COVID-19. And for us, we have to look at the multimodal transportation. We've got to look at the final mile segment, the intermodal, dedicated truckload, truckload brokerage market and look at all the all the different places that we are touching the customer and making sure that the service and the relationships there we're, we're talking to the customers about our, their inventory as well as how well they are stocked for the forward going but we're also helping them maintain the balance because they again i said it earlier they can't have too much when you go to um, how much is in their warehouses because it gets costly for them and then we're focused on the nearshore, and we think that's a huge opportunity for us in the U.S. and, and Mexico. Uh, every week, we're looking to help our customers with different ways of shipping transportation. So we're looking at, do you want to hold some shipments back and ship larger LTL shipments? Do you want to ship multi-stop truckloads? There's so many different ways that you can do it and be innovative with your customers. And we, you know, we've got unique platforms that allow you to help do that, especially within our managed trans product. Recently, we've been able to see you know, where we have still picked up stuff from China and we're delivering it all the way to the door in the home in the US. And we saw in COVID-19 that gyms shut down. And as gyms shut down, people were ordering fitness equipment to their homes. And so we're, we have seen a massive lift on fitness equipment being picked up in China and we're handling every single piece of the transportation all the way into the end consumer's home. <laughs> And you started to touch on this, Drew, um, you know, about this acceleration of uh, e-commerce. Of course, that's been happening for, for many years now, but, you know, this event really seems to be kind of a watershed moment for uh, really accelerating that, that existing trend. And, you know, just think about all the people who have been, you know, shopping online really out of, out of necessity, you know, rather than making an extra trip to a you know, retail location and, you know, uh, consumers now seem to be increasingly comfortable, you know, ordering you know, from a broader range of product categories, whether it's uh, groceries for home delivery or maybe curbside pickup or uh, some of these large and bulky items like that exercise equipment, uh, you know, furniture and, and, and large appliances uh, now just ordered online rather than, than, you know, going to a store first. And, you know, Drew XBO uh, has a, a large final mile business, as, as you mentioned, and now I'm curious to see, you know, to hear what you're seeing, you know, how, how much of a change in, in e-commerce patterns have you seen as a result of this pandemic so far? Seth, we were the first ones to feel the e-commerce growth in our final mile business. You know, we're going into 10 million homes every single year, and we're seeing that tick up this year through the pa pandemic. And I believe we're in the early innings of the acceleration of what you're seeing on the e-commerce growth. One of the things that our last mile team did is, they sent out a survey to the end consumers. So we went to our customers' customers and we asked them just a few simple questions. But there's two points that I'd make off of it. 55% of people are doing do-it-yourself projects at home now. I know whenever I come home every, every week, it looks like my wife has started a new project or she's ordered something new that's going in the house. And the, the second piece is 94% of people are more likely to continue to buy online and have it shipped to their home post-pandemic versus what they were pre-pandemic. You know, our, the consumers want speed and availability. I've talked about XPO Connect, our platform, a couple of times. Within last mile, one of the things that we've done is contactless delivery. 
So we create e-signatures where you can actually social distance or even curbside delivery for the customer. And you don't have to see them. You deliver everything they need to the device to where they can see it. And this is helping our customers manage their supply chains. Yeah, and Chad, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on e-commerce as well. You know, how is CR England thinking about e-commerce and, and how do you think it uh, might affect freight distribution strategies overall uh, moving forward? You know, it's funny, a few years ago, we were approached, somebody said, hey, you know, all this online shopping has got to be terrible for your business. Uh, as if um, electronically somehow goods get trans transferred to somebody. Uh, there, there's trucks in between. And, and so we've, uh, in a major way, uh, adapted and adjusted. Uh, in fact, we work a lot with XBO uh, on this. Um, the, the uh, you know, our dedicated business in our company has grown where now it's the biggest part of our business. And we, we work uh, with many customers on final mile and, and local deliveries. And, and it's it, at this point, um, you know, dedicated and, and final mile are a huge part of our core competency. Um, but, you know, there's over the last few years, certainly there's been a strong deterioration to our overall length of haul. We've seen localization of freight, uh, you know, data utilization predicts buying habits, uh, it, it get down to the product, even skew specific uh, needs. And it's, it's exciting. It's incredibly dynamic and we're glad to be part of it. So, uh, y you know, e-commerce is here to stay uh, and, and we're happy to, to be a part of that. You know, but the thing that we're comforted by is we'll continue to see a migration to localization in e-commerce with more local DCs, but that freight still has to get from the DC, from the manufacturer grower by truckload. And we're here to help with that too. Got it. Now, um, and of course, in the early days of the pandemic, uh, when you know this was still, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty, and you know there was some you know panic buying, especially at grocery stores. You know, I, I mentioned this earlier, but uh, you know it was pretty remarkable. I think how well the nation's uh, food supply seemed to hold up. You know, there were some you know outbreaks at some meat processing plants, but you know generally you go to the store, and even with the panic buying, um, you know, food was was very much widely available and. You know, CR England, you're, you're one of the country's largest transporters of uh, refrigerated freight. So I'd like to get your, your perspective on this, Chad. You know, how well do you think the nation's food supply chain performed uh, during the pandemic? And, you know, are there any takeaways or things that you think might change as, as a result of this experience? Well, better than I would have expected, knowing how severe the pandemic was, is the, is the easy part of the answer. Um, and same goes for our business. However, still some major bumps in the road, some some very difficult things. So obviously, as we all know, uh, all, uh, so much pressure went on grocery uh, retailers as opposed to food service and restaurants, um, where uh, you know, I, I think the stats that I heard were grocery was up 70% and food service was down 50%. So uh, you, you know, I'm probably talking to a lot of trucking company people and the, depending on who you're aligned with with your customer base, you probably felt it differently. We're, we were thankful to be very diversified to where some segments of our business were way up and other parts were way down. Uh, amazingly, in most cases, it kind of balanced itself out for us. Um, but, you know, there were some disappointments as well. You know, there's all kinds of waste uh, that happened. You know, there were crops that weren't being har harvested, uh, milk being dumped. There, uh, you know, the meat industry had probably bigger problems than anybody I can think of where they're having issues with people not wanting to come to work uh, because of, of COVID and, and some problems at plants and labor issues. And uh, yeah, the, the meat industry was as, as uh, disrupted as, as anything that I saw. But um, the good news is at this point, you know, I, I would say uh, they're back. Um, it's not, maybe not a hundred percent, but in most cases, uh, they, they are they are pretty close to fully recovered, and you know customer demand in general right now is the highest I've seen in years and years, if not ever. Now, apart from the coronavirus pandemic, you know this has also been a, a significant time of change for international trade, and of course uh, the USMCA uh, agreement has replaced NAFTA. 
Um, you know, Brexit is partially done, but still, you know, going on. Uh, and of course, there's been all the, the tariff changes and the ongoing trade war with the U.S. and China. Uh, so I just want to get your thoughts on, on how your businesses have been adjusting to this uh, pretty significantly shifting landscape for global trade. And I'll start with you, Drew. You know, how, how have you and XBO been managing through all these changes? A few questions ago, Seth, we, we talked about nearshoring, and that, that's really where it starts. And we, we expect that trend to continue in the current environment over the next few years. Now, when you start looking at the political landscape and, and what's coming forward, our customers are really, really smart. And this is something that they're always assess, uh, assessing the political risk when they're making their supply chain and transportation decisions. And we're working with them on a daily basis on what that looks like. Uh, Tad, you're going to hear your thoughts as well on, you know, again, international trade, USMCA, uh, really just kind of a, a recalibration and, and uh, adjustment of, of these trade deals. You bet. You know, um, I mentioned earlier we're, we're a leader on this, our southern border with Mexico, and then we're also a, a leader in refrigerated intermodal. So these issues hit home hard, and we think about them a lot. Um, Network balance is is the key that we really think about. Is you know the first of all stability uh, of of the situation. You know what our balances are going to be like, and so we really focus on California and the southern border as what what gives us the, the most attention. Now we are very pleased with USMCA that it was finally signed signed and ratified by all three countries and. Companies are now uh, more comfortable to schedule manufacturing, site contracts, plan their budgets. Uh, that's good for business, and we we share this confidence. So, uh, you know, we're we're less certain uh, on California as it relates to U.S.-China relations. Uh, that's a little iffier, but for now, uh, you know, we we try and design the network to support our customers, and and we're hoping it, we're hoping that uh, we'll see more certainty after the election in November, whichever way it goes. Got it, well, thank you for that. And, you know, uh, I'm curious to, to just hear a little bit more about how the two of you spend, uh, you know, your time. Uh, I know, of course, it's, it's clear now that uh, transportation companies have been dealing with you know, just uh, a really unpredictable and, and rapidly changing business environment uh, over these past few years, and, and especially this year. Um, so just how much time and, and effort do you spend on, say, risk management compared to day-to-day uh, -day management concerns and you know, business optimization and, and business expansion. Uh, you know, Drew, I'll start with you. You know, how, how much is this sort of area of risk management and risk planning, you know, how much time is spent on that area? Yeah, risk management is something that we spend a lot of time, but at XPO, it's not one or the other. You know, all risk management, keeping the operations day to day, and as well as looking at the future growth are all part of our DNA. So they're in every single conversation of what we're doing. You know, I'll, I'll tell you three pillars that we've got that we're really focused on right now and, and every day. The first one's obviously the employee safety. We've talked about the testing, the deep cleanings, the tracing, social distancing, and all that stuff, but we're very focused on making sure that our employees are coming to work in a safe environment. The second one is continuing to keep the operations up and running. Our customers depended on us to have our operations up and running through the pandemic. And a lot of them depended on us to keep their doors open through this because our customers were hit very hard through the pandemic. And I was proud of the way that our tech team was able to respond because literally overnight, we shifted thousands of people to work remotely and work from home on a day. And the last one that you're talking about, the growth, is customer solutions. We don't ever want to put our customers in a box and say doing business with XBO has to look like this. We want to be able to work with our customers and make tailor-made solutions, multimodal solutions using great technology. And our customers have appreciated that so far through the pandemic. So for us, it's not a you know, risk management versus operations versus growth. It's really having all three embedded into our core DNA and who we are at XBO. Good. And Chad, I'll give you a chance to, to respond to that same question on you know, how much of your time and effort goes into, you know, planning for, for risk management and, you know, disruption versus, you know, the more day-to-day -day concerns? I love Drew's answer um, be, because you can't separate safety from the rest of the business. And in fact, we, we adopted the mantra safe and on time every time. 
which uh, we, we give out, um, uh, you know, the fluorescent jackets to our drivers for safety purposes. And we have that emblazoned on them, uh, safe and on time every time, because to us, it's, it's all part of the same process. So, but you asked about, you know, risk management. And fortunately, the amount of time we spend on risk management uh, has grown tremendously because of so many changes. So I'm going to complain a little bit, you know, uh, there's, uh, and this comes, risk comes from so many different angles these days. Uh, of course, there's accidents and, and plaintiff's lawyers and, you know, life care, medical plans and nuclear verdicts. And, uh, but in addition to that, there's aggressive wage and hour lit litigation. There's runaway labor legisl uh, legislation. There's uh, insurance that's going out of control and where some companies can't even uh, get insurance at different layers. Uh, you have government investigators and union recruiters maintaining their steady advance and trucking and transportation. I, I guess the way I'd say it is it's no longer just about moving products from A to B. We now have to deal with risks that range from A to Z. So, you know, I spent uh, a few years as our VP of safety and now as CEO, it seems like I spend almost as much time on risk management now as I did back then because of the landscape that we're in. So uh, it's just part of the business. And if you're not good at being safe, if you're not good at taking care of your people and the general public, uh, you don't have any business in this industry. Yeah. Now, uh, before we wrap up, I also want to you know, leave on a sort of a forward looking note and you know, just to look ahead at our industry's future. So I'd like both of you to, to share any final thoughts you may have on you know, how the freight transportation industry is going to change in the years ahead. You know, Drew, I'll give you the, the first shot at this one. You know, what's our industry going to look like? Uh, you know, crystal ball question, you know, five, 10 years down the line. You know, Seth, it, 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 you, you said it whenever you, you asked the question. It's a crystal ball question, right? And I think when you look at what the last 24 months has been like, it's been a very volatile market. It's gone from a very tight market to an extremely loose market to a very tight market again. And I think that you're going to continue to see that. You're going to continue to see waves within the transportation. And, you know, again, customers are going to look for the people who they know are going to be here tomorrow with them and who are going to be able to create unique solutions to service their needs and partners that are giving them great service, technology platforms, and then partners who are able to, to flex up and down on the capacity side. So I think that we're in for, I don't, I don't see the market changing and I think it's been a roller coaster for the last 24 months and I, I think it'll continue. Chad, you have final thoughts to, to leave us with? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what I'd like to focus on is I think we're going to see, uh, uh, we're going to continue to see uh, and even maybe accelerating with the tight market that we have now. I think truck trucking capacity is going to be harder and harder to find because I think it's going to be harder and harder to get good quality drivers that that can do the job in a, in a safe and productive way. Um, so I, I foresee because of that tightness, because of the, the shortage on drivers, I think we're going to see uh, transportation will get more expensive and hopefully uh, the, the more expensive part of tra transportation will be passed on to our drivers that we'll see wages going up that we'll see uh, that that will create less turnover more retention uh, and we'll, we'll see drivers stick at the same place a little bit more than they have in the past. Uh, when that happens our industry will get safer. Uh, we'll, we'll provide better service. So we gotta, we've got to focus on that. And, and as a carrier, I'll tell you, you know, we are, we are so determined to make sure that we have great jobs for our people because as we do that, as we uh, protect our drivers, as we make sure that we're, we're giving them the best career opportunities that they can have, uh, we'll find success. And I think that's, as much as anything, the key to, to winning in transportation these days. Well, it'll certainly be fascinating to see what the future holds. Uh, though, let's all hope that it'll be less tumultuous, tumultuous than uh, than 2020 has been uh, thus far. Um, I do think that's a good place to, to leave it. So at this point, I'd just like to, to thank you both for sharing your insights on uh, risk management and the, the future of the supply chain. Really appreciate you uh, taking the time. Happy to be here. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me, Seth. Yep. 
And of course, uh, to our viewers, uh, thank you for watching. And uh, I hope you'll stay tuned as we continue the conversation about the future of freight. Thank you, Seth Chandru, for that insightful conversation. One of the primary ways trucking and logistics companies have created efficiencies and charted a plan for growth is through technology innovation. Whether it's been incorporating AI, driver assist technologies, or data analytics, tech investments continue to be key. Seth Clevenger will join us again to discuss some of this investment strategy with three industry leaders, Sid Brown, the CEO of NFI, Jason Ringenberg, the CIO for YRC Worldwide, and Drew McElroy, the chairman and co-founder of Transfix. Stay tuned for an exciting discussion on tech future-proofing. Hello, I'm Seth Clevenger, Managing Editor of Features at Transport Topics, and I'm excited to welcome you to this final panel discussion of our virtual summit on the future of freight and supply chain management. In this session, we're gonna discuss next generation tech investments and future-proofing in the transportation industry. Trucking and logistics companies have been incorporating increasingly sophisticated technologies into their operations, including data analytics, artificial intelligence, business process automation, as well as the first wave of electric powered trucks and advanced driver assist capabilities. In the past, transportation companies have been testing and implementing these technologies primarily as a way to improve efficiency. But in light of the coronavirus pandemic, many are also viewing these investments as tools to increase resiliency during uncertain times. To help us learn more about where the industry is headed, I'm thrilled to welcome three industry leaders. First, I'd like to introduce Sid Brown, CEO of NFI Industries, a major provider of trucking, logistics, warehousing, and distribution services with more than $2 billion in annual revenue. Also joining the panel is Drew McElroy, co-founder and chairman of Transfix, a digital freight marketplace founded in 2013 with the goal of using technology to reduce costs and improve efficiency in the truckload freight market. And I'm also pleased to welcome Jason Ringenberg, Chief Information Officer at YRC Worldwide, one of the largest less than truckload carriers in North America. This is really a great lineup for a panel like this, so I'd like to thank you all for joining us and really looking forward to getting into this. And I'll start with a conversation by reflecting on the COVID-19 pandemic, which uh, of course has been just a, an extremely disruptive event for much of the freight transportation industry, especially in the early days of the pandemic. So I'd like to ask each of you to go through and just tell us how your companies were able to adjust to these challenges, while also explaining the role that your technology investments have played in that response. So I'll start with you, Sid. You know, how did NFI adapt to this crisis and, and what role did technology play? So, Thanks, Seth, and thank you for allowing me to be on this panel. Appreciate it. So when we first dealt with this crisis, uh, it was a matter of getting all everybody together in one shot and saying, okay, how bad is this going to be? And nobody had any idea when you kind of think back to it. So we planned for the worst and hoped for the best. So we expected somewhere around the 20 to 25% reduction in our revenue base. We, we, we fortunately... Uh, have a lot of customers that are essential shippers, so we knew we had a kind of a, uh, a, a, a mark that we didn't think we would go below, but still, 20% hit's a pretty big hit. So we had to make some tough decisions. I brought everybody together, and fortunately for me, I've been through four of these before. Uh, I always know at the end of the day, things will get better. Sometimes people forget about that, but ultimately things recover. So I wanted to make decisions that made sense. What enabled me to have a lot of confidence were really the fact that we were prepared to go remote um, and our IT group and the systems we had in place allowed us to do that from a corporate standpoint. But obviously, all our field operations between our transport operations, our cross-stock operations, our fulfillment operations, our core warehousing operations, our freight brokerage, those folks were all field ops and they reported to work every day and they were really our everyday heroes. But our technology allowed us to kind of operate almost seamlessly from what we were doing to what we had to do. And uh, I attribute that to large infrastructure investments we've made over the last few years in our systems uh, across all our service offerings. But really, at the end of the day, I think remaining calm, segregating out the noise of what's real, from what's fiction in terms of what you hear out there and approaching it with a, a sense of urgency, but clarity. And so we went about it. Um, I made some tough decisions, um, furloughing people, freezing wages, 
cutting back on 401k. I mean, things you don't want to do, but nobody knew what to expect. And then I over communicated with my team and I communicated with our employees. I did biweekly videos in the beginning to let everybody know what was going on because there was a lot of fear out there in, in the marketplace. We were able to kind of at that point, you know, go along as the world was going along. Fortunately for us, our business did not see the dip uh, that we uh, expected. In fact, we only saw about a 4% dip because while some folks were going down or shutting down, other folks were shipping like crazy, particularly the grocery houses, for example, and the appliance folks, for example. So we were able to really reposition assets uh, from one operation to another to handle the surges over here and the shutdowns over here. But even besides that, at the end of the day, we did have employees. And I think our peak, we had about 650 employees that we had to furlough out of about 15,000. So when you look at it, it's about 4% of our workforce. You know, one of the things that also happened, all of a sudden travel, you know, restrict travel. Nobody's going anywhere. And as evidenced by this video, you know, everybody's doing it by video now. And that really changed the perception of how people could interact with people how we could onboard people, how we could train people, how we could deal with customers. So it really was a, a combination of being able to call audibles every day almost for a while there because you never knew what the regulations were going to be from one day to the next. That has all settled down to a certain extent as you look back at it now, five, six months later. What hasn't changed is the travel. We're still not, unless we have startups that we have to, and we do have a bunch of startups going on, that you have, you know, you ha might have to send support. But even then, our IT support, which used to go on site, is doing a lot of this by video today. So our travel and expense budget is substantially down, which has hap happened to help our profitability, uh, like a lot of other things. And I think we're all going to learn to figure out where the, where the right mark is for having travel. Because I do believe at some point you do have to have some interactions. You do have to have management out there meeting with, you know, the operations folks um, and, and getting to see your customers. But there were no expectations in the beginning for people to actually go and see each other. And so I think it worked. But I think over time that will change. So when you look at it, I think, you know, as a leader, you want to lead. And I believe that what we did as an organization was make some hard decisions quickly, monitor the situation, ignore a lot of the noise of you know what was out there and really try to get the facts, and then continue to guide the company forward. And since that time, we've been able to reinstate the wage, you know, the wages to where they needed to be. The 401k's been reinstated. And fortunately for us, our company is having a record year in terms of revenue and earnings, and we're very fortunate to be on that side of the fence. Well, it's great to hear that things have uh, definitely uh, improved and you know, we're, we're starting to, to see our, our pathway through you know, all this disruption. And uh, Jason, I want to turn to you next. You know, how did YRC adapt to you know, all these challenges and, and the market volatility that was caused by this pandemic? And you know, can you speak to the technology that uh, helped you uh, manage through this? Yeah, sure. I mean, first and foremost, just like I said, I mean, you know, the vast majority of our people still reported to a terminal every day. So all of our frontline truck drivers and our line all drivers, our pickup and delivery drivers, our dock workers, you know, they went to work every day delivering what we used to call essential freight back during those days of the lockdown. So first and foremost, we all owe them a debt of gratitude for the work that they did. From a technology perspective, you know, there's really three or four things that it helped us with. So first of all, when it comes to our network and the optimization of our network, when we did run into hot spots because of COVID and we had areas of the country that were shut down or areas of the country where our not all of our drivers could get to a terminal. We were able to reroute that freight, you know, to the next closest terminal to try to be able to service those customers as best we could when there were hot spots or flare-ups that didn't allow the normal course or the normal route to be honored. You know, the second thing that we did is we made a lot of investments, as I'm sure all of the panelists and other companies have over the last few years, in the technology that our, you know, our back office workers, you know, use. And that allowed them to be able to work from home so investments that we've made in cloud solutions, investments that we've made in video conferencing, you know, investments that we've made in firewalls and different cyber aspects of it, 
allow the vast majority of our people that work in one of our office locations or one of our headquarters locations to be able to quickly, you know, work from home without missing a beat. And then I would say, you know, last Seth, one of the things that's come out of this, as Sid said, you know, travel has been nearly non-existent. So we've been able to use some of that technology that we use inside of our four walls with our customers. We've been able to do lots more video sales calls. We've been able to do lots more meetings and, you know, onboarding of customers and things with video that before we normally would have flown somebody, you know, to get there. So from a sales perspective, from a network optimization perspective, it's been there. And then obviously the input, you know, the investments that everybody's made and their web technologies to help answer and provide our customers better levels of, you know, self-service as, you know, call centers and things might have been disrupted in the operations. All of those things helped us, you know, to continue through the early days of the pandemic when we had the initial dip in volume. And then as that volume has started to come back. Well, thank you, Jason. And uh, Drew, I'm going to turn to you next. Uh, you know, talk us through how Transfix responded to, uh, you know, this, this crisis when it hits. And, you know, of course, you are a, you know, a technology company and a transportation you know, company at your core. Uh, so how did you make this, this adjustment to this, this new world? Yeah, absolutely. And, and first, Seth, thanks very much for having me. And it's a pleasure to be on the panel with, with these other uh, fine gentlemen. Uh, so it was a little bit different for us uh, relative to the, to the other two companies here. Uh, obviously, our head, employee headcount is a bit smaller and we're a non-asset based company. Um, so slightly different answer. Um, but we are also headquartered in New York City. Uh, so we were, um, you know, we felt at least we were sort of in the eye of the storm at the very beginning. Um, and so one, uh, initially, of course, the first thing was focus on our business and our team, make sure everybody's healthy and safe and all that good stuff. And I'm incredibly proud of uh, sort of the, 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 the stack that, the, that we have built allowed us. We made the decision, I believe it was March 14th, to go 100% remote indefinitely. And we were 100% remote on March 16th. So within 48 hours and uh, throughout, even at the very beginning and throughout the course of the, you know, the evolving events here, our per person productivity is actually up. Uh, so in incredibly proud of the sort of internal work we've done. And that, you know, that came together very quickly, frankly. Uh, and so that, that, that allowed us to then uh, turn our attention to those that we serve, meaning both the carriers and drivers, as well as our shipper partners. Um, and actually, before I mention the technology, I'll actually talk about sort of the human side of it, believe it or not, because that's sort of where we started, right? This was a, this was a bit of a gut check moment. So on the, on the carrier side, um, uh, we partnered with an organization called TIER, which is the Truckers Emergency Aid Response Network. And, and uh, we're donating PPE at truck stops all over the country and, and sort of tracking our PPP inventory digitally. Uh, and we started a pay it forward campaign where we were giving our sort of core drivers uh, I frankly, we're just giving them, it wasn't money, it was gift cards, but we were just trying to, just trying to help uh, because this was not the time to, to pinch pennies. Um, so that was, that was it. We did those things to make sure we shored up our supply base at a, obviously a very, you know, volatile time. Uh, and then we, of course, turned our attention to our shippers who, as Sid mentioned, you know, it's, it's interesting. It, it was very, it was a very bifurcated sort of result, right? There were those businesses that effectively got whacked and, and had almost nothing going on uh, for a period of time. But then, every, you know, the other side of the coin was the business that went absolutely gangbusters. Um, and, you know, we were, we were fortunate that not only were we able to serve those businesses from a, you know, a capacity and execution standpoint, but some of, the, some of the features of our platform started to take on a new life uh, in the context of the pandemic, right? Things like um, digital PODs, right? Historically, we would talk about that as an opportunity to save time and manage paperwork in an effective way, which is great. But then when you layer it on, oh, by the way, it's now touchless and you don't actually have to even interact with anybody and you, know, you can minimize the risk. Those sort of you know, digital aspects of our business took on an entirely new level of value in this sort of context of, of what was happening out there. So um, you know, the, the, the real truth is I'm incredibly proud of the work that, that our team has done to sort of support both ourselves and, and sort of our external partners. Um, I don't call it seamless, but it was, uh, you know, considering I, I think we did one hell of a job. Well, thank you, Drew. And, uh, you know, looking ahead, one interesting question that hasn't been answered definitively yet is how this pandemic is going to affect technology adoption in the trucking industry. You know, of course, on one hand, you know, many companies have really lost a lot of revenue as a result of this disruption. So, of course, maybe that means that there's just less capital to invest. But at the same time, I also hear that the pandemic has really shined a spotlight on how important it is for transportation companies to be nimble enough to 
to adjust their freight networks during such uh, volatile conditions. So I'd like to hear from our panelists on this. Uh, I'll start with you, Sid. You know, how do you think that this historic event is going to change the way that transportation companies think about technology? Well, I, you know, I think it was a pause for a lot of folks, um, but the mission still remained. How do we, you know, get better utilization, asset utilization? How do we provide better data to our customers and to our internal employees so that we can manage our fleets better and try to optimize where possible uh, in, in terms of that? And we've been working on some AI, uh, uh, I'll call it stuff because it's, uh, it's kind of pretty complex with some pretty complex algorithms in place, but uh, doing some predictive analytics around can we take our customers' data and figure out how we can plan for the optimum fleet size, and then we can share fleets a little bit more effectively by from multiple customers. Um, we focus on the dedicated fleet side of the house, and so it's real important for us to try to see where we can maximize between customers when possible. And then on our warehousing side, can we take in and optimize our, our workforce in order to uh, take the projections and see, you know, Lots of companies have projections. The, the, the validity of those projections can vary widely. So what we're trying to do is take historical data and formulate it for the future. The problem with that today, and I see the problem, is we are under a new paradigm. So taking historical shipping patterns and trying to predict what's going on now, you almost have to throw it out because we're under a, a completely new scenario. So as the leader of our company, there was a period of time where I paused on some initiatives just because nobody knew what was going on. But we have quickly expedited our investments in continued investments in cybersecurity, which is paramount for us in terms of our operations and our continuity plans, continued investments in the rollout of our new systems across our platforms so that we have continued consistency amongst what we do for our customers. And the other uh, thing that we're continuing to do is upgrade the, uh, the hardware and the software where necessary or put more onto the cloud where we can in order to ensure the viability of our, you know, our operations. It was interesting when this whole hit, everybody was saying, all right, what's your business continuity plan? What's your business continuity plan? So everybody was saying, all right, okay, you know, here, you know, let's bring it off the shelf and show our customers our business continuity plan. And a lot of times I think they were asking us for it because they didn't have something and they were looking and scrambling because nobody had a continuity plan for what a pandemic would do to the, to the world. And if they told you they did, I, I don't believe it because nobody was expecting this. So it, it's been interesting to kind of see, you know, the ebb and flow of the investment dollars that we're putting into technology um, over time. But I can tell you, we, we also have a big initiative going on where we have a group of folks trying to create what we think is the next state-of-the-art TM package for our freight brokerage and our transportation management group, uh, which we will ultimately bring into our dedicated fleet group. So it's all about data. And the more you can get your arms around this data, and the more you can measure it, you can manage it. And so that's where we're focused. Um, you can, you know, whether it's business intelligence, artificial intelligence, predictive analytics, it's all about getting the data into one repository where you can really begin to measure. Well, like you said, and uh, Jason, I'd like to get your uh, you know, vantage point as well. Uh, you know, how do you think that, you know, this, again, historic event is going to change technology investment in the transportation industry? Yeah, first of all, I mean, I don't think there's going to be a cutback in spending on technology because of the pandemic. Was there a pause across a lot of different industries and a lot of folks in our industry? I think that was. And most of those pauses have probably stopped by now. You know, one of the areas I think you're going to see a lot more focus and ramped up investment, and Drew alluded to it earlier, is, you know, now everything wants to be contactless. So that digitization of the supply chain and the digitization of those documents, in our case, the bills of lading, the delivery receipts, things like that, that have been around for a long time. You're going to see continued investment in that. You know, as Sid said, you know, cybersecurity is probably more of a concern for a lot of people now. The bad guys didn't take time off during the pandemic. 
the bad guys looked for weaknesses and vulnerabilities because people weren't behind necessarily always the firewall that they were when they were in their office. So I think you're going to see, you know, continued focus, you know, in and around there. You know, ATA's got their own, you know, SciWatch program that many people are involved in. So I think you're going to see continuation there. Um, you know, I think all of the data that's available today, including in that is, you know, videos and pictures, is going to become more and more pervasive. There's going to be more spend in those areas. I think if you look at some of the larger, you know, cloud service providers, whether that's, you know, Oracle or Microsoft, Google, and, you know, AWS or Amazon, you know, are the ones most frequently talked about. You know, they have tremendous machine learning capabilities. We are an industry that, you know, takes a lot of pictures. So how can you use those pictures in conjunction with, you know, those four providers and the other big cloud service providers to try to drive, you know, machine learning and make efficiency improvements. And then I also think you're just going to see continued investment in IP technologies associated with the drivers and the trucks. So call it internet of things. How does that change when we get to more of a 5G rollout, et cetera? And I think, you know, you'll see more and more of that, whether it's the driver devices, whether it's safety devices, whether it's cameras, technologies, GPS locations will continue to be, proliferate the industry. And if you kind of take a look at several of those different components, whether it's, you know, LIDAR and the radars that are needed, you know, for autonomous vehicles, it's going to be 5G technologies, edge computing, Internet of Things, all of those things that kind of culminate together, you know, in and around solutions for autonomous vehicles. So. I don't think you're going to see a slowdown in spending technology. I think it was more of a pause. I think things are going back to normal. And ultimately, I think technology spend is going to continue to increase across everybody in the industry from the asset you know, based companies like ours to the asset lighter, the no asset companies. I think it's going to be pervasive everywhere. Great. I'll, I'll get your take as well, Drew. Uh, how do you see technology spend, technology investment uh, moving forward in our industry? Yeah, I mean, uh, so certainly, certainly, I believe that that investment in technology is going to, to continue to increase. I, I think that the slope of that curve is increasing and, and not the other way. Um, I think when we look back on this period of time in, in history, the, the biggest thing from my perspective, the way I, I find myself thinking about it is it's an accelerator of already existing trends. And we're finding out very quickly both on the sort of the 3PL side and frankly on the on the shipper, specifically on the retail side, which businesses made the proper investments before this and which did not. And so in many ways, this is like the arbiter of the future. Like, are you going to survive or are you not? Uh, and, and so like anything, um, those businesses that are unable to invest, I think the gap between the haves and the have nots is going to widen. And, and, and those businesses that can make the proper investments will be that much more differentiated on the, I mean, frankly, even right now, but especially on, on the way out of this. Um, and so what, and as I sort of alluded to in the last question, we're, we're very fortunate that, you know, because of our sort of nascency and, and the way we built our platform, we were able to sort of respond quite quickly. And, 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 and so we focused our attention on how do we, again, how do we help our constituents? And so, um, you know, frankly speaking on the carrier side, a lot of that tech, you know, touchless and all that fun stuff, you know, was already deployed. And so the conversation we had with those folks is more about how do you ensure um, that you don't get stuck uh, either in a bio bi biological hotspot or in a, in a place you've never been and, and you know, the, the economics of the truck get really, really bad really quickly. Uh, and so we had, prior to the pandemic, we had launched our core carrier program, uh, which is effectively moving toward like a quasi-dedicated model of time-based purchasing rather than load-based purchasing. And, and of course, one of the value props to, to the carrier side when we do that is the volatility curve gets, gets flattened. Uh, and, and as perhaps you can imagine, the sort of uptake and adoption of that program at the, at the beginning days of the pandemic was almost to the point where we had to pump the brakes and, and make sure that we weren't taking on, on too much so that we could continue to serve the folks who came on. Um, so that was, that was, frankly, I think very good for the carriers and, and very good for our business because it sort of shored up our capacity in a, in a way that I think is hard for non-asset based businesses to, to traditionally do. Um, and so that allowed us to, again, you know, turn to sort of the, the shipper side. And, you know, I mean, the, the preponderance of our customers are either big retail or sort of big CPG serving retail. And, and, and again, it, it sort of became that, that, that binary thing, right? Either you're trying to save every single penny you possibly can, 
or you're trying to do the proper things to make sure you serve your customers, maintain inventory levels and everything else. And, you know, frankly speaking, we, we work with both types of customer, but I would say those who are most progressive about this and who are, you know, reallocating inventory and saying, okay, well, how do we make sure we can do, you know, true omni-channel, whether it's on, order online and pick up at the curb or whatever it might be, making sure that all of that was supported by data and visibility and transparency and all that good stuff uh, in, the, in sort of the, the backdrop of no one having any idea what's going on. Um, like I said, I think that, that sort of proved well for our business, but I think more importantly, it, it allowed our customers to continue to, to operate and, and, you know, sell widgets, which if you don't do that, you're in big trouble. No, I, I think that, uh, you know, pretty much across the board, we, we heard from this panel that, uh, you know, technology is indeed, you know, a core to the future of, of our industry. Uh, and it, another example uh, of the, the types of technological changes we're seeing uh, is also taking place in trucking equipment. So truck manufacturers and their, their fleet customers are now beginning to test electric powered commercial trucks, you know, not just, uh, you know, something that you see on a, on a trade show uh, uh, floor, but uh, in real world uh, freight operations. And you know, again, it's, it's early days, but it's helping to pave the way for broader adoption in the years ahead. And, you know, this, this is a quite a change. I mean, this is a brand new vehicle category in the commercial truck market. And uh, just so happens that NFI has been among the first to actually deploy these vehicles, uh, in this case through partnerships with Daimler and Volvo. Uh, so, Sid, can you just tell us a little bit about your experience so far with electric trucks? You know, how have they been performing, at, you know, to this point? And um, how have your employees reacted, uh, especially your drivers? Yeah, just so for reference, um, it was a little over a year ago that we unveiled these trucks out in California with Freightliner. And we put 10 of them in use down at the LA ports, between the LA ports and our Chino campus, where we run a big warehouse campus. And we began to test these as they came in. And, you know, we've learned a lot. And uh, so what did we learn? Some things. Driver uh, behaviors change a little bit. Uh, driver's perceptions of what they should be doing in terms of the acceleration or deacceleration on the trucks are a little bit different. Uh, highway traffic will impact battery life, which we didn't really realize would happen. Weight will impact battery life more than we expected. The stop and go traffic has both its positives and negatives on battery life. So a lot of learnings as we go and we try to uh, utilize these trucks and learn from them. So We've been tinkering with them with Freightliner in the beginning to kind of see if we can maximize battery life and maximize utilization of the trucks. Um, and so the, 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 the haul between the port and the warehouse is, I think it's about 60 miles. So, you know, our goal was to try to make two turns a day. In the beginning, we weren't getting two turns a day. Um, we're getting about a turn and a half. Uh, we put chargers in. Uh, we invested in the chargers. Uh, between Freightliner's investment and our investments, this is millions of dollars um, in order to begin the process of learning and figuring it out. Followed by two trucks that have recently come in that we just announced with Volvo, part of the first Class A trucks that Volvo has, that we're going to put in similar applications to start seeing and we're learning from <coughs> Volvo out there in Southern California as well. Fortunately for us, our average length of haul is less than 200 miles. And so therefore, we have a, a, a great application to go out and come back across <clears throat> all 4,500 trucks that we operate day in and day out. So we believe over time that this application makes a lot of sense for us. We also have a lot of warehouses that we think we can put solar panels on, and we're working with Volvo on this now. <clears throat> excuse me, to allow, you know, the panels to put the charging stations down below in the, by the, the warehouse yard. And so it's a closed loop system. And we're hoping to really see the benefits of that over a period of time. But if you think about an electric truck, those things will last a lot longer. There's a lot less moving parts. There's a lot less requirements for technicians to fix all those moving parts. And it's hard to find technicians out there today. So the useful life of these trucks is going to be made much greater. The battery technology will continue to change. So you'll put in new battery technology 
as you continue to move forward. So we're at the infancy of this. There's a lot of testing. Nobody's in mass production right now. You, everybody's claiming that you know they're going to be there quickly. I think we're still about 18 months away from one of the OEMs really beginning to deliver the technology on a on a mass production or a scaled production scenario. But I made the comment, I don't know if you remember, Seth, that I thought that I went out on a limb and I thought that by 2025, 30 to 40% of our fleet would be electrified. Um, the only thing that might hold that back is more the manufacturer than us. And, you know, some of the grants that the states have still need to be worked out because California is a leader in this and they're doing a wonderful job of promoting clean air. And I think everybody has seen that just recently they said, oh, no more passenger cars with diesel gas as of 2035. So there's a big push to clean the air up in, in not only California, but really through many states in, in the country. So I think the regulatory environment will catch up a little bit with where the tech technology is over a period of time, but we're excited about the opportunity to bring electric trucks to the forefront of our fleet for our drivers and do the right thing for the environment and cut down on our carbon footprint. Nobody, and if you look at the major manufacturers, the OEMs, are really spending a lot of time reinvesting in the diesel-powered engine anymore. They're just kind of going to continue to ride out what they've done. They're putting all their money, if they're smart, and most of them are, into electrification going forward. Yeah, no, it's really fascinating to watch this, this whole new category of the commercial vehicle market emerge before our very eyes. And, you know, like you said, it's in its infancy, but... Uh, you know, we can we can see the potential um, in the years ahead. Uh, but Jason, I want to get your thoughts on this as well. Uh, what's Wire's T's view, um, not only on electric trucks, but uh, maybe all other alternative fuels and trucking? Uh, what's your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, with electrification, I think it's, you know, it's important. It's something that we're cur currently watching, you know, very closely. We think there's a lot of use cases for it. You know, some of the things that, you know, Sid mentioned, some of the shorter hauls, we think those use cases will come along you know, sooner than that. And some of our businesses, our length of haul is, you know, much longer than that. So it's not only the, the truck and the batteries and how long the battery lasts, but it's how do you charge those batteries when you have people that need to drive distances or teams of people that need to drive distances longer than the batteries can go, you know, on a full charge. Um, so one of the other things, you know, we've looked at and have continued to look closely at is, you know, what about clean diesel? I mean, because if you just look at the diesel engines, if I'm not mistaken, I think, 96, 97-ish percent of the trucks on the road today run diesel. If you look at those diesel engines and the clean diesels, I think it's somewhere around 60 diesel engines today produce the same particulate count as, as one truck, you know, from 1988. So there's got to be, you know, some bridge to electrification. You know, we think that clean diesel is at least, you know, one of those bridges you know, CARB and the mandates that are coming out of California, I think everybody understands that they're coming. So for us, electrification is something that's there. As others have mentioned on the panel today, the, the maintenance associated with one of those is going to be a lot less. It's going to be a lot easier to maintain those. They're going to have probably fewer breakdowns, you know, but it's all about batteries. You know, Tesla from a, you know, non-commercial or non-commercial, but really from a consumer perspective, had their battery day the other day. You know, they think they can get the price of a Tesla automobile that was supposed to sell for $35,000, but in actuality is sold closer to $50,000, their Model 3 on average. You know, they think they can get a battery that's going to, you know, lower the price of that to $25,000 and be able to go further. When you start talking about that type of jump in battery capacity, when you start to talk about that type of reduction in the cost of a battery, that I think becomes game changing or more game changing for our industry because the use cases that you could use that for in our business, you know, the, the options, you know, that um, Sid talked about, you know, where you have to go turn a rail head or you go to turn a port or some of those things where the length of haul is relatively short and you have a facility on one length of that turn, you know, that's maybe one of the earlier use cases. And maybe one of the furthest down the road use cases are those team drivers that you have that are going to pick up a load of freight on one of the coasts and over the next several days drive it to the other coast. And then I think it's as much or more about the charging infrastructure that's available to those drivers on the road as it is necessarily about, you know, the batteries and some of the things, you know, in the cabs. But 
to try to you know uh, reduce emissions, to try to you know reduce carbon footprints. All of those things are here to stay. It's going to be a great change for our industry when it comes along, and I think it will stage itself in you know over time and hopefully clean diesels and maybe some of the other you know biofuels are help provide a bridge to that you know cleaner world where we can have you know electrification that is hopefully someday solar powered and other you know less polluting sources of the ultimate charge itself yeah and I, I think that you know you make a good point about you know the application is, is really key you know at least in mm -hmm. the near term you know electrification can make sense for you know port drayage uh, short haul urban distribution sure. uh, applications like that but uh, uh, for example a regular route uh, truckload course you need a place to charge and you know that you're, you're limited by the battery range and and the vehicle weight so there are many factors to consider and you know we're at the very you know beginning of this uh you know very interesting change in a new category of vehicle and uh you know of course uh diesel will be will, will be a big part of the industry for for years to come of Seth, course. Seth yes. I, I might want to add one other area that Certainly. you know I, I uh yard spotting and we, uh, I forgot to mention that we, with CalMAR, I think we've got like 30 electric yard uh, trucks working in California now. <clears throat> and that's going to be a huge opportunity. Think about all the yard trucks and the yard spotting that are just a real natural because they're, they're not going anywhere. And so, and not only with the yard spotting with the electric, but then you can adopt the autonomous electric truck right in the yard too. So a lot of research in, is going on on that end as well. Yeah, that's actually a pretty good segue, I think, to uh, talk about automated driving technology. Of course, that's been another important trend we've seen developing uh, over time. Um, you know, we see this evolution in terms of, you know, the active safety systems that are available on the market today, uh, collision mitigation systems, and, you know, we're starting to see the very beginning of active steering uh, capabilities added as well. Uh, but at the same time, you see technology developers that are, are testing and refining highly automated vehicles, uh, you know, self-driving trucks on public highways, you know, especially uh, the Southwest has emerged as a, as a hotbed for, for testing. Uh, NFI, have, of course, has, has partnered with uh, Ike, which is one of these companies that's, that's doing this testing. Uh, so, Sid, while I have you on this topic, uh, could you just tell us a little bit more about the, the potential you see for automation, you know, automated driving, driver assist, uh, all the way up to self-driving trucks uh, in our industry? So, first of all, um, my brother, his first name is Ike, and I want to make a disclaimer, he has nothing <laughs> to do with Ike the Automation, but he got interviewed uh, regarding our, you know, partnership with Ike, and, you know, so here's the way we look at it. You really still got a long ways to go. And not just from a technology standpoint, but from a regulatory standpoint. And I, you know, I fear that maybe the technology will beat the regulatory environment there. We don't right now see the day, at least for the next five to six years or longer, where that driver is going to be totally displaced out of that cab. Just from, you know, if you look at airlines today, they still have pilots. Why do they have pilots? The technology's there. Those planes can fly by themselves. They got the drones that fly by themselves. That technology is available. It's the just-in-case right now. And I think from a regulatory standpoint, that just-in-case is going to stick around for a while with the driver in the truck. However, it will take an alleviate, particularly on the long haul, where you can put a driver, you know, maybe you put one driver in a lead truck and maybe a second truck follows behind it and so forth, you got three trucks, but the longer haul may give the driver the opportunity to be less impacted by the stress of driving the truck because it essentially will drive itself for the most part. In the urban environments and the environments that have much more impacts by weather, it's gonna take longer to develop that technology because there's more variables that need to be associated with it. But there's a lot of dollars going into it, and the, what I do see is a lot of these dollars are getting and ending up uh, with companies that are partnering with the OEMs and it's on the automobile and it's on the truck side. So I think eventually the OEMs will be the leaders along with whoever they partnered with in bringing the autonomous truck platform to our environment. 
someday, maybe when I'm long retired from this business, Seth, trucks will be totally autonomous. I'm sure they will be. I mean, it, it's an inevitable once they get that technology. But I still believe in, in shorter haul applications where you have to do, you know, make a delivery and unload the trailer. You're going to have to have a driver in that truck. So I think there's going to be a hybrid. Uh, the one thing for sure, people are not raising kids to be truck drivers today. It's not. So we, we have a shortage. So how do you address <clears throat> a shortage? Through technology. So whether you, you know, robots in the warehouse, autonomous trucks on the highway, it's still addressing a labor shortage that will exist out there going forward. And Drew, I want to bring you in on this. Uh, of course, you're, you know, uh, non-asset based company, but uh, I think that uh, you know, you, again, you're a technology company, uh, you're, you're a logistics company. Uh, how do you think uh, about automation at Transfix? Yeah, I mean, so I, I would I would agree with with what Sid said that the the day of like full level five automation, where the matrix just takes over and there's no more truck drivers. I, I, I think Sid said at, the, at the, the earliest, he said five to six years. Well, I would take the over on that. Uh, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of things to do, both from a technological perspective, which we've mentioned, from a public policy perspective, which we've mentioned, uh, but also from an infrastructure perspective. And, and Jason touched on this a little bit, but it's not just the charging. It's the actual amount of electricity that's going to be pulled from the grid if this were actually happening in, in massive scale. So I think all of these things are it's, – it's going to be – you know. It's going to be a steady march toward this future, but I do think it's a ways away. And I, I do think, and I realize that the, the, the driving community is very sensitive about this. And, you know, as, an, as, as somebody who's in the middle, we're, we're agnostic. We want to work with the best solutions across the board. Uh, but I, I, when I talk to drivers, you know, listen, the reality is, you know, Sid mentioned airline pilots. Manufacturing has gotten massively automated there are still manufacturing jobs. And, and, you know, the partnerships that we at Transfix have done with a variety of, of, of you know, whether you call it self-driving or all of these companies, um, it seems to me, uh, with the exception of maybe a few that have very, very deep pockets, most folks are thinking about uh, the middle mile, right? The, the sort of the highway to, to the ramp to the ramp. And then if you have that model, well, hell, if you're a truck driver, that could actually make your life a lot better. You know, you, it, it makes jobs that are today over the road maybe look like, you know, day jobs and you get home and things like that. So there are opportunities both from a structural perspective and also just as a personal anecdote, as somebody who lives in New York City and was stuck in my apartment during this pandemic, I went out and bought a car and drove it to California. And that car has pretty significant self-driving. And, and for what it's worth, driving across the country, I mean, I'm, it's still there. I'm still on the wheel, but just the ability to sort of relax your posture and, and, you know, take a step back. I mean, we talk about the health issues in the driving community. Well, the stress of being on the road is no joke. And if these technologies can make you safer, make it a little bit less physically exhausting to do the work you do, those are, those are benefits. So, I, you know, as a, as a personally, not transfixed, I'm, I'm bullish on the technology because I think it can save lives in, in a variety of ways. But I also, like with anything, you don't want the hype to over, overload us. And there is, a, there is a ways to go. And, you know, Incremental steps will be good and, and perhaps not damaging to any individual like, like the truck drivers who think they're maybe not going to have a job or something like that. I, I don't think that's a massive concern, to be honest. And, and, and as you know, Sid said, there's, there is a shortage of truck drivers. I, I argue about that a little bit because I would say maybe there's a utilization problem. And if you get the utilization right, maybe there's enough truck drivers. But either way, there are probably more truck drivers retiring than coming into the business. So the, the total sum is going down. And the economy continues to grow. So, if you can have the the autonomous curve come up and sort of meet the self or the the traditional curve, you can have enough capacity in the market. Yeah, and I'm glad that we're kind of addressing that elephant in the room about you know what automation means for uh, truck drivers. And and I'm you know fully agree with uh, you know what I've heard on this panel. And you know I've I've always been you know quick to make the argument that uh, you know automated driving technology is going to complement drivers rather than replace them. And you, even if you have uh, cases and, and instances where you can go fully autonomous, you know, it's going to be designed for a specific application. Um, you know, it's not, it's not going to be, you know, going through Manhattan, for example, um, or, you know, just it's going to be designed for a certain use case. And, you know, there's, there's simply no doubt that we're going to need professional truck drivers uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, but, you know, to your point, 
the technology could make those jobs more attractive, safer, better jobs for that next generation of drivers. And uh, Jason, I want to bring you in on this too. Um, you, know, you, you spoke on about uh, this topic a little bit earlier, but yeah. you know, where, where do you, how, how do you view automation and, and what do you think it means for truck drivers moving forward? Yeah, first of all, I agree with uh, you know what Drew just said. In five to six years, I'm going to take the over on how long we're going to need truck drivers. Uh, I think you know these advanced driver assist systems. I think it's going to be a great thing for safety. I think it's going to be a great thing to help make the job, you know, more attractive. And I think everybody on the panel today, and most everybody that's involved in and around technology, thinks that the technology or the underlying components of that technology will be available for the policy is. And you know, today that policy in large you know, extent is done by the states. I mean, certain states let autonomous tests go in, certain states don't. Certain states allow those in our industry to pull triples, other states don't. Some states have more tolls to pay for infrastructure, some states don't. So from a policy perspective, it's just not the folks, you know, Seth, near your office in DC that have to weigh in this, it's the other 50 state capitals. And, Last time I checked, to get all 50 states to agree to X is a really hard thing to do, regardless of what X is. So I think it's going to be there. And then I just think there's huge societal questions to this. You know, even if it is safe or the data shows that it's very safe, you know, if you're driving down the road in your minivan with your two kids in the car seat and back, are you going to want to see a truck that's carrying 40,000 plus pounds? without a driver in it, barreling up behind you, or you're passing that? What are the insurance companies you know, gonna say about this? So there's a lot of constituents to have to you know, weigh in on this. If you look at the investments today that's being made, I think that's why we think the technology, internally, we think the technology will be available before the policy climate, because the investments being made in you know, machine learning, the investments being made in the you know, the 5G networks, the investments being made in batteries, you know, those things are going to come along. But what about all of the other investments that need to be made? What about all of the other policy concerns that need to be made? So I think there are great jobs for truck drivers for years and years and years to come. I think it might have been Drew that mentioned the middle mile. You know, certainly there is a case for the middle mile and for platooning and some things like that that will have much higher automation than we have today, but not be fully autonomous for quite some time. Got it. And uh, you know, just shifting gears a little bit here, um, you know, one of the biggest trends that I've noticed uh, over the last decade in our industry is just a, an absolute influx of uh, you know, new technology developers, new businesses, startups, uh, venture capital. You know, uh, you know, the saying goes, you know, Silicon Valley has, has certainly discovered trucking. And, and my apologies, Drew, of course, not every uh, tech startup is based in California. But, uh, <laughs> you know, as, an, as, a, as a tech startup in this, uh, in this field, I, I, you, know, you, you grew up in this industry. But, uh, again, it's a, it's a technology-driven startup. Uh, just, just tell us about the opportunity that you saw when you decided to, to start Transfix you know, seven years ago now. Uh, why did you think that trucking and transportation was ready for you know, some, some newcomers to, to bring in, you know, a new approach. So it's funny. I was, I was on a panel the other day, not, not for our business, but a, a more generalist one. And the, the, the moderator introduced me as a tech CEO. And I was like, no, no, it's a, it's a legit, no, but uh, so I, I, whether for better or for worse, it's in my DNA and it has been for a long time. Uh, so what, what did I see? Um, well, I mean, bluntly speaking, I saw a lot of unhappy people and a lot of waste. Um, you know, the, the, the business that, that my dad started that I sort of grew up around was a, at its core, at least initially, it was a traditional, you call, we haul brokerage. Uh, and, and a very good one, but, but it was what it was. And I watched every day the amount of paper that got pushed around and just wasted time and just the general unhappiness. Everybody seemed to BS each other, right? The, the driver said he was there when he wasn't. The, the broker said the load was ready when it wasn't. And all this misinformation just drove everybody crazy and ultimately wasted a lot of uh, time and money, right? We were fo you know, fighting over pennies while the dollars were just flying out the window. And so at its, at its basic core, what we set out to do was take technology and basically in two forms. One, mobile technology that, you know, at this point in time, you know, we started the business in 2013. Every driver had a smartphone. And that, that was a change that hadn't existed 
for. And so now there was a way to tether to these drivers to passively collect data without any effort on their part. And so that, that on the one hand, infused a tremendous amount of data about behavior and locations and preferences, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the same time, if you can sort of overlay that with, you know, to, to keep the buzzwords to a minimum, I'll just say modern data science, right? AI, ML, all that good stuff. But what it really means is a system, a computer, can take huge amounts of data, specifically dynamic data about available trucks and dynamic data about loads that need to be picked up by those trucks and match them in a way that creates a more efficient set of results than any group of humans can manage. It's just too much data. And so at its core, that's what we set out to do, right? You can, you can put more money in a small trucking company's you know, P&L by running the same number of miles and the same number of days and the same number of hours if you have a higher percentage of those miles loaded. It's pretty straightforward, right? And so that, that becomes a positive ROI solution for the carriers. And then, of course, on the shipper side, uh, the transparency and the data collection and the benchmarking and the scorecarding and all that goes along with having an intelligent network as opposed to maybe a blind network, which would exist historically, that creates uh, what we think and, you know, sort of proving itself out to be a, bin, a win-win for everybody, right? I mean, at its core, the sort of value creation thesis is eliminate and monetize waste and give some of it to everybody involved. Um, and so that's, I mean, that's, I mean, honestly, that's, I was crazy enough that I actually wrote a business plan when we started this. I don't, I don't know too many startups that actually do that, but I actually wrote a business plan. And if you go back and read it seven years in, it's basically the same thing. This industry is wasteful and everybody seems pretty cranky. And if you use technology in the right way, you can probably improve them. I, I won't say it's a silver bullet, right? This is still real life and things still happen out there. Uh, but, you know, if anything, when things happen, at least you know about it and you can tell everybody involved and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's the mission we've been on. And, you know, knock on wood, fortunately for us here, seven years in, um, we're accelerating uh, in, in sort of all ways. Uh, our growth is accelerating, um, which is interesting. It's not just new partners. It's, it's going deeper with the partners that we have, which in some ways to me is even more telling. You know, at the beginning, you'd talk to a very large retailer who would be like, oh, this is, this is cool. We'll try it. And, you know, here's, here's your two lanes or here's a couple of loads. And then, you know, the next year you become a top five provider. And then the next year they say, hey, can you help us with this RFP? And it's like, okay, there's something here. The nature of our depth uh, as, as really driven by data and insights, um, it, it's, it's, it's telling, I think, and it's something that we're very proud of. Well, thank you, Drew. And, uh, you know, another uh, big trend that we see, not just in uh, transportation, but really in, in all fields of technology across uh, many industries is the advance of artificial intelligence and machine learning. You know, in trucking, some companies are beginning to use AI to help automate some of the, the back office processes, freight matching, and just enable some, some better business decisions that otherwise, you know, humans might not have noticed on their own. Um, and I'm going to point, point this one to you, Jason, as a, as a CIO. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on, you know, what, how AI and machine learning can, you know, drive more efficiency uh, in, in our industry moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, everything you mentioned, you know, Seth, robotic process automation, there's going to be a lot of, you know, advancements there. But, you know, when I think about it, or as I've thought about it here recently, you know, I really think more about it from a, from a customer service perspective. So can you use cameras to take pictures to deduce loads that are likely to have damage versus loads that aren't likely to have damage? Or understand as you're starting to load a trailer, where you have waste in there that you could get more freight on there. So, you know, how can you use these pattern recognitions and the massive amount of computing power that comes from some of the, you know, the larger cloud providers to take thousands and thousands and thousands of pictures to replace things like supervisors going to look at trailers to see are they loaded properly or are the trailers full? So how can you concurrently using machine learning drive down your cost free up your supervisors to focus on other things, lower the likelihood that you're going to have a claim and an upset customer. So how can you do all of those with a computer and pictures? There are other applications of it. I mean, you know, when you do your pre-trip inspections, you know, could you have those vehicles drive through video 
and look for cameras or videos, look for things like, you know, tires that are underinflated or brake lights that don't come on or hydraulic hoses that may be disconnected or even if it gets down to, you know, the efficiencies of the skirting and those things that are going to help with your fuel economy until we get to this fully electrified, you know, world going forward where they would be able to then stop and alter course before that trailer is closed in the case of looking for load quality and in the case of looking for trailers that are full or in the case of when you're doing it in the yard look for those things that you would certainly want to know as a carrier before that truck left the yard to go on to that next destination i really think that's going to be some of the areas where specific to transportation we see you know these uses. Obviously, what we talked about earlier with autonomous vehicles, there's massive use cases for artificial intelligence and machine learning. Some of those, as we talked about, have regulatory issues. Some of those have societal questions. But here, I think everybody can agree, if a trailer is full, that's good for all parties. If a trailer is loaded properly, that's good for all parties. And if that equipment, when it hits the street where we share that with everyday drivers, if it is safer or more ready for that run, I don't think there's any policy concerns. I don't think there's any societal concerns. And I think these are ways where we can use pictures and pattern recognition that isn't um, profiling the human face, but rather profiling freight in the back of a trailer or profiling the safety readiness of a tractor trailer combination as it gets ready to hit the road. And I think those things, the technology is nearly there today and is coming on quickly. And we'll see massive improvements for all across our industry for us, makes it more productive for us. It makes it safer for all of our customers. It makes it more likely that their shipments are going to get their damage free. Nothing but goodness associated with it, in my opinion. Well, this has been a, an outstanding conversation. I am going to be you know, cognizant of the time, though, and perhaps I'll give each of our panelists you know, one final uh, word on, on really where you see our industry going in the years ahead. You know, perhaps uh, we can look ahead 10 years and envision where, what trucking will look like. Uh, Sid, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, any final thoughts on, on how you see our, our industry evolving in the years ahead? So... Um... Let me go back and qualify. I didn't say that all fleets are going to be running autonomous trucks five to six <laughs> years from now, guys. I take the over on that bet too. So let me say that. <laughs> so, uh, so a couple things. Um, we are already, you know, with technology. So we're doing through a group called AI Noodle. We're uh, um, looking at the PMs on our trucks, and we're doing predictive analytics. It used to be that you know you do a PM, and there were sixty things that were on the checklist to do. Well, we're now predicting, well, there are 60 things you don't have to check because some of these things, we now have the historical data to, to say it's not going to be in a failure mode until 60,000 miles instead of 30,000 miles. So now our people are doing their PMs. Instead of doing 60, they might be doing 32 items because the predictive analytics are showing us that we don't have to do all 60 of these. And, you know, just like Jason said, machine learning and, and automation are all going to continue. You know, uh, just the way we're, you know, dealing with each other now through video and the amount of travel that's not going to be there and you know, those types of things, the way you bring on new business uh, and, and interact with customers is, is probably going to be different than what it was before. Um, so in some ways that's good, some ways it's bad. I, I think in some ways the personal relationships may suffer a little bit, but that's, you know, that's just the way the world's going. What I do see on the trucking side is a con it's an industry that will continue to have consolidation. Um, you see it in the LTL market, Jason's, uh, you know, there's probably, you know, five or six major LTL carriers and maybe 35 really LTL carriers in the country today. On the truckload side, there's a ton more the bigger getting bigger, and, and we're hopefully going to be part of that bigger. Um, but there's going to continue to be pressure. The insurance markets are going to continue to weed out. the. I mean, there's some real pressure in the insurance markets today based on these uh, nuclear verdicts and so forth. So if I were to predict 10 years from now, I, you know, I, I think that 
there's just going to be less carriers running better technology, well capitalized. Some of them will have automated trucks. Some of them will have electric trucks. Some will have natural gas trucks. Some of them will have diesel powered trucks. It's not going to be all one at, you know, at one time, but just go back five years ago. And how many Teslas did you see on the highway? And how many do you see today? And how much you see, you know, think about it's that curve when you get that technology comes down, those prices come down on batteries and so forth. You're going to see an explosion on certain technologies that are going to take place. And, you know, so whether it's, you know, what's happening on the technology side as Drew has alluded to, or Jason has, I just see a, a convergence of factors that are going to make our industry more efficient and efficiency will drive down cost and that will benefit both the customer and the carriers. Well, thank you, Sid. And uh, Drew, I'd like to pose the same question to you. You know, trucking in you know, 10 years from now, how will it be different? So I've, I've, had, I've had two jobs in my career. The, the, the first one was at my family's business, and then the second one has been at Transfix. And, and they've almost been about the same amount of time. And, and what I can state unequivoc unequivocally, it's a lot more fun right now. Uh, the, the, the amount of investment in this business, in our industry collectively, and, 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 I, and I mean the supply chain, I don't just mean trucking, right? Whether it's warehouse automation or trucking or you know, robotics, whatever it might be, man, is it fascinating. And, I, and my, my sort of running statement is every day is a case study. I don't know what's going to happen, but it's, it's going to make you think, which is a lot more fun than you know, just blocking and tackling. So, um, and if anything, my, my core belief is what exactly is going to happen? I don't know. But I believe strongly that the trends we're seeing are only beginning to accelerate, right? The, the, you know, everybody talks about the amount of capital that's come in. I would argue we've seen nothing yet. Uh, the, the capital that has come in thus far has mainly been early stage capital uh, and, 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 and less risk averse capital because it was at a very nascent point. As businesses that have raised that capital continue to put up results and accelerate and, and do the things that frankly businesses like ours are, are doing from a sort of metrics perspective, um, the sort of pools of capital that are going to be brought to bear on our industry are going to become bigger and more sophisticated. And so, like I say, I, 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 think, um, I think this trend is going to continue to accelerate. We're going to see winners and losers, of course. And, and, and I mean that both in the, the company level and frankly at the, the pure technological level, right? Some ideas will be proven to be fantastic and some will be proven to be hype and maybe not sustainable. I think anybody uh, suggesting which of those are going to be the winners and losers, I, I think it's a little premature for that. We have to see what's going to happen. But the reality is the genie is out of the bottle. Um, those that are outside of our business see how big our business is and see the opportunity financially that can come from improving it. And and then when those sorts of folks get their eyes on something, they don't generally stop. Uh, so I, I think that what we've sort of kicked off here is in the early innings. Uh, and I think we're going to just continue to see more of it, which I ultimately think is a benefit for everyone, right? It's a benefit for those in our industry and, and you know, sort of all ways. And I think, you know, we all talk about this, right? Our, our business touches everything. You know, my, my mom says everything is delivered by a truck except babies. Uh, and so the more, uh, the more, we do to improve what it is we do, the more that that sort of downstream benefits everybody on this planet. And so I'm, as you can perhaps imagine, I'm very bullish about what the future holds. I think it's really exciting. Take us uh, to, uh, you know, trucking in 2030. What's it going to look like? Uh, what, what's the future of our industry? I mean, I tell you, we, we should all welcome the technology investments because nothing but good can come from that. If I knew where our industry was going to be in 2030 and which technologies were going to you know, be pervasive, I'd be a hedge fund manager instead of being a CIO. <laughs> but what I do know is that for the years to come, there are going to be jobs for truck drivers, as we discussed earlier today, and there's going to be a lot of good jobs available. That technology, well, I don't know exactly what it's going to do. I can tell you it's going to make our drivers more productive. It's going to make our trucks safer. It's going to reduce our carbon footprint. It's going to help our part in the case of the trucking companies. You know, it's going to help us be better members of that supply chain. It's going to help improve society and where we're going. But as far as which of the technologies we talked to today in terms of, you know, autonomous vehicles or AI or machine learning, you know, similar to what Drew said, I don't really know which ones are going to win and which ones are going to lose. But 
I don't think there's going to be anything but goodness that comes from the investments. Also, like Drew, I believe that we're in the early innings of this. I think the seed capital has started to come in. If you look at our impact from a supply chain perspective on GDP, there's obviously a lot of, you know, a lot of cost in that supply chain. There's a lot of opportunity in that supply chain. And I think when people start to realize that this technology and you get beyond that seed capital, I think we've only seen what's going to come in in terms of, you know, money that's going to be invested and benefits that technology is going to provide. So from an industry perspective as a whole, I think we should be abundantly optimistic about our future. And I think we should welcome and embrace all of the technology advancements that are coming. Well, thank you uh, for that. And I think that's a great place to, to leave it off. Uh, I mean, this is a, again, I think it's been an outstanding conversation, but uh, you know, there is a time limit, unfortunately, but uh, again, you know, I'd like to thank all three of you for, for sharing your, your excellent insights into where this industry is headed. And I think it's just, it's really valuable for us all to, to think about what the future may hold. And uh, to our audience, of course, thank you for, for watching and uh, I hope you'll stay tuned for some closing remarks. Thank you to our panelists and Seth for that interesting conversation. And that brings us to the end of today's symposium. I wanna thank Secretary Chow, Senator Cardin, Representative Graves, and all the panelists for joining us today. We certainly have covered a lot of ground. As our panelists have suggested, regardless of the strain the pandemic has placed on freight, companies are finding a way forward to adjust to new challenges. At the same time, COVID-19 seems to have offered a backdrop upon which technologies are being tested and explored and are helping freight companies continue to grow and thrive. Senator Cardin and Congressman Graves both reflected on lessons learned from COVID-19 and how a resilient supply chain is not just a top priority for both of their committees, but is considered a matter of national security by Congress. Both lawmakers also emphasize the importance of rebuilding America's transportation infrastructure with critical freight industries top of mind. A more resilient economy and supply chain are paramount to developing the domestic capacity to deal with uncertainty. Thank you to everyone who tuned in today, and we hope to see you at part two of CQ Roll Call in Transport Topics Virtual Event Symposium in the coming months. For all the latest on transportation policy, visit rollcall.com or follow us on social at Roll Call. And for the latest industry updates on trucking and freight, visit transport topics at www.ttnews.com. Thanks again for joining us for today's program.